certain that we get a chance to say something about the contents of these books sure because it's very important that uh, people know that uh, you know whereof you speak not only do you lecture and teach and you're an artist and an architect and an archaeologist and some other things built talking to buildings buildings talking to you that's that's a category all by itself they haven't named that one yet but um, you have written, as you said, six books, and you've, co you've edited or co-authored six additional books. And so I'd like you to talk about the contents of some of these books, Finding Karakamoon. 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 Mm -hmm. This book. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Uh, Finding Karakamoon is my latest book. It was... Uh, published in 2011, and it uh, basically documents uh, the project that we're involved in now, which is the excavation of the 25th Dynasty tomb of the priests of Karakamun in Luxor, Egypt, on the west bank of Luxor, Egypt. Uh, this is a tomb of, um, of a man who was, um, he was the chief, he was the first Ak priest at, uh, at Pedai Sut. He was the priest responsible for doing the morning libations in the Temple of Amun, uh, the Holy of Holies, uh, the, the space that uh, Jehudi Mr. III referred to as the ancestral room. He was responsible for saying the words to draw the spirit of Amun, or Amen, which is the unseen presence of the Creator. There it is. So he said the words every morning to evoke the presence of the unseen presence of God into his Holy of Holies so he could literally inspire the 80,000 people who worked within that environment. And we're excavating his tomb. Uh, we just found out last year that uh, Karakamun worked during the reign of Shabaka, who was the second uh, king of the 25th dynasty. That's the question that Hunter had. He wanted to know the significance of the 25th dynasty pharaoh Taraka. Um, Taharka, Taharka. Taharka, mm -hmm. right to Karakamun and saving the Israelites? That's his question. Uh, yeah, well, you know, what, what's interesting about Kemetic history is that um, there is this misperception about who the ancient Egyptians were that's recorded in the Bible. Um, it's, it's, in, it's interesting in the Bible, they know everybody's name. So and so we got 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 so and so and so and so said this and and this was his wife and this was his son and he lived so many years they can name everybody but when it comes to the kings of Kemet they just say Pharaoh they don't know their name mm -hmm. what's, what's up with that wait a minute well, you know, they weren't there what's up with that you know they they weren't there and they don't know it's a fabrication so Taharka is the only. Kemetic king who was mentioned by name in the Bible. Taharka was of the 25th dynasty. He was the uh, last major king of the 25th dynasty. There were five kings uh, who were part of, who constituted the 25th dynasty. They came from uh, Kush, or what is now modern day Sudan. Taharka <coughs> followed in the footsteps of his ancestors and secured Kemet from first the Libyans and then the Assyrians and restored the land of their ancestors in Kemet. Taharka, in chasing out the Assyrians, went as far north into the area that is now known as the Middle East, Israel and Jordan. And he liberated uh, Jerusalem from the Assyrians, which is why the Hebrews referenced Taharka specifically by name because he was a real person. And he accomplished a specific task that is documented in history. All these other references are, are, are just stories. Well, what about the Pharaoh who was holding the Hebrew children in bondage? What about him? Is that not <laughs> so? It's right there in the good book. Well, as a minister friend of mine told me a long time ago, Tony, the Bible contains truth, but the Bible is not true. And you have to know how to read it in order to discern fables from allegories, from stuff. 
even in um, Hebrew texts, the Ed Hayom, for example, which was uh, one of the more recent uh, revisions of the Torah, they acknowledge that uh, the story of the Israelites being enslaved in Egypt and being led out of Egypt by Moses, uh, i.e. the Exodus, they acknowledge that that story is a metaphor. That story is not a actual historical event. It describes a process or a condition that takes place within the mind and within the body. And it was written in allegorical form. Those who know that understand the message within the story. Those who don't know that take the story literally, just as with Adam and Eve. You know, any, any, I was going to say any thinking person, but that wouldn't be the right word to say. Any person who understands biblical history knows very clearly that a, a person named God did not create man and woman out of the earth. That that story is, a, is an allegory. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, one of the significant things that we found in the tomb that we're excavating, the tomb of Karakamun, is in 2010, we found um, pyramid texts. Pyramid texts that were copied from uh, the pyramid of Unas, the fifth dynasty pyramid of Unas. These texts on the wall, the tomb that we are currently excavating, are copies of the oldest religious texts ever written. These texts were written at least five, six hundred years before Abraham, the first Hebrew, was born. And these texts talk about the salvation of the soul, talk about uh, the, the judgment of the soul, talk about the soul going into heaven to be reborn. So to get back to one of the uh, first questions that you asked me, what we find through the study of Kemet is the foundation of what later became Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's all in Kemet if you know how to read the text. And if you don't go through someone else's interpretation of the text, that is one of the reasons why uh, people uh, don't want to associate Kemet with Egypt and Egypt with Africa. Because if you looked at it in that context, then you realize that it was African people who gave birth to uh, the three major Western religions. I love that. I don't know what to say, except that that's a very great answer. And I love truth. So when I hear it, it resonates. I I mean, truth is a stranger to many people. Uh, they've never well, heard it uh, <laughs> before. And, and when they hear it, that just can't be true. And their mantra, more or less, is, my mind is already made up. Don't confuse me with the truth. It's easier to believe a lie if that's what you've been fed all your life. And I understand that. I, I, I truly understand that. And some people are very uncomfortable hearing a truth that separates them emotionally from their past or separates them emotionally from what their parents taught them. And, 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 and that's fine. People are entitled to believe whatever they want to believe. You know, I, I, I wholeheartedly accept that reality, but I also accept the fact that nobody has the right to impose their beliefs on somebody else. Now, that's exactly where we join forces. From the Browder file, there's a question having to do with, uh, with uh, some of the contents of the book, but first talk about it, and then I'll ask you the question. Uh, the Browder file was my first book. Uh, I wrote and published that in 1989. It's a series of uh, 22 essays on various aspects of African and African American history and culture. It's one of my best sellers. And one of the questions that we have is your dissertation on hair. You know, this, the writer says it was quite comprehensive and please elaborate. Uh, the Politics of Hair is the title of that, that, uh, that particular essay. And you know, the beautiful thing about it is you don't really understand, you don't really begin to understand how insignificant hair is until you start losing yours. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so what, what, what you begin, or what I began to see as a child of the 60s, I understood uh, very clearly how hair has been used as a means of expressing our consciousness. I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and there's a, a chapter in, in there where Malcolm got his first process. Yeah. And he talked about how he's getting his process and it was winter time 
and you know you leave the lie on your hair. The longer you leave a lie, your lie, the lie on your hair, the, the straighter it becomes. Uh, but if you leave it on too long, it burns your scalp. Mm -hmm. And the lie was on for a long time, and then uh, he went to rinse it out, and it was cold, and the pipes froze. So he had to literally stick his head in the toilet to wash the lie out of his head. And, he, and you know, he reflected on how crazy he mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. getting caught up in this thing called hair. Um, and, and so, in the, you know, back in the 50s, all black men wanted the process. You know, the temptations, you know, all the temptations mm -hmm. had the process. Curtis Mayfield, the impressions, they all had the process. Anybody who was anybody had the process. Mm -hmm. and, and basically what it was is we wanted to look like white folk. We wanted to have straight hair. And in the 60s, when we began to embrace our African identity, then it was about going natural. It was about developing an Afro. Mm -hmm. And that then became a symbol or a metaphor for our consciousness. So I began to see an association between how we wore our hair and our consciousness. Later, uh, locks became another expression of, of consciousness. And then as the assault against African people ramped up, uh, we see then a regression in our hairstyles. So we go back to uh, the 70s, you know, we wore afros in the 60s, but then we began to move backwards in 1971 when Curtis Mayfield came out with the soundtrack to the movie Superfly. And Superfly had a perm. Mm -hmm. So now you have brothers who had an afro mm -hmm. one week, and next week they get a perm. Mm -hmm. and that's when drugs begin to flood in, in, into our communities again. And then from the afros, you went to a jerry curl. And from Jericho, you went through all these hairways. And, and what we now realize very clearly is that by us slipping backwards, changing our hairstyles, we similarly lost consciousness, political power, economic power, and social power. So now, 40 years down the pipe, we find ourselves in 2012 in worse financial shape today than we were in the 1960s. Worse political shape today than we were in the 1960s. Our communities are destroyed. Our schools are destroyed. Many of our children are destroyed, don't know who they are, uh, behaving in a way that is horrifying, all because we lost sight of what this thing was all about. This thing wasn't about integration into a white community. Integration literally meant the disintegration of those things that sustained you and your family. That was the only way others were going to accept us. If we gave up everything that allowed us to thrive as a people and attempted to become something that we could never be. So, you know, I hope I don't offend anybody, but this whole idea of perming your hair, how can you call it a perm if it's temporary? You gotta go back every two weeks <laughs> to get your hair did. It ain't a perm. You know, you look at what's happening in our communities now where you know, sisters are wearing weaves. And, 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 and the weaves and are, 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 are owned by folk outside of our communities. Sad. People are obsessed with, with these fake nails. Uh, and all these chemicals that destroy you. Uh, and, and now there's this thing as a result of, of, of this pornography that some folk call music, where you're watching uh, these young, young girls who have reduced themselves to what Mylana Karinga referred to as pulsating genitals. You know, you got Rihanna, you got, um, you've got uh, Nick, Nicki Minaj, uh, and you got all these strange color hairstyles, the, the red and the blonde and the green and, and the fake eyelashes. And these young, impressionable minds who don't realize that they're being fed a diet of poison will try to emulate what they think is beauty and they'll waste the best years of their lives engaging in risky behavior that will result in two, three, four children that they didn't want, children that they can't take care of, children whose lives they're going to destroy, uh, engaged in, in, in risky sexual behavior that will result in, in, in AIDS and, and HIV um, and, and, and get caught up in a lifestyle of, of drinking and drugging that is going to end, that has ended too many lives too soon and produce children without parents to love them. Every child deserves to have two parents, not at a mama least, and a baby daddy. At least. At, at, yes, at least two parents. Um, but, but, but what happens is we become accustomed to dysfunction. 
And as a consequence, we find ourselves backsliding, such that we're in worse shape today than we are, than we were uh, 40 years ago. And, and so that particular essay in The Browder File uh, talks about that aspect. Uh, and then there's other essays that talk about food and diet. Uh, we are eating ourselves to death, a phenomenon which Tom Morell in his book Brainwash referred to as suicide. You know, mm -hmm. uh, black yeah. folk Lila die. Africa calls it neutricide. neutricide. You know, so, you know, we are, again, we have to acknowledge who we are. We are the descendants of the creators of culture and civilization. We are Africans living in America, are the wealthiest, best educated Africans on the planet. But we're in probably the worst shape of any Africans on the planet because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in and not being able to distinguish who our friends are and who our enemies are, and us desiring to be more like our enemy than our true selves. So it, it goes back to the, the question that you, uh, you asked me earlier about uh, my understanding of the fact that not all of us are going to make it. Not all of us are going to make it. That's a fact. But we have to begin to realize that those who will make it will make it because they understand who they are and they make a conscious choice to live a different quality life. Well, I just think we're the best miseducated people on the planet. Other than that, I agree with every single thing you've said because the education that we've gotten cannot, if it does not serve our own interests, if it does not teach us who we are, then it certainly is not a ducere, which is to mm -hmm. draw forth from within. But at some point, we have to address the self-hatred that we have learned that leads us to the kind of behavior you're describing. Because it, it just is distressing to me to see us enrich so many people from outside of our community with buying things that simply uh, uh, accessorize if, if it does that, accessorize something that is even more beautiful without the accessory. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see that women have gone overboard. Some women have gone overboard. Not only are they be, by, buying what in my day we call false hair, mm -hmm. but they are buying it in abundance. You know, they have hair that is, you know, longer than hair grew on people, you know, so that, you know, we, we are going into these places where we are not treated well, we're disrespected, and I know this because I've had students who sat before me and told me that when they go into these stores owned by these outsiders, that uh, they are impatient, that, uh, that they, they disrespect the males, disrespect the women, they, yeah. they pat on them, they, mm -hmm. they make overtures toward them, they form, uh, you know, whatever kind of temporary alliance they want to. Sometimes they father children in our community. They are getting way more. They're, they're doing more business in our community than just selling us goods. Mm -hmm. But they are also forming relationships, and they're getting all kinds of benefits. They're getting all kinds of perks from being amongst us, and they come in, and they take the wealth of the community out of the community, send their children to college, buy their homes, support their families in other parts of the, the world. And we are here impoverished and becoming more so every day, mm -hmm. struggling in every way to maintain the essentials of life. And it doesn't seem incongruous to us that we are buying nails that we can grow that we are buying hair that we can grow. If we want hair, all we have to do is leave it alone. It will mm -hmm. grow. So the, the point is that when, when you talk about self-hatred, you know, that has to do with the mutilization, mutil, mutilizing, I guess is the proper word, of the mutilation of, of, of our, our persons, the, 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 the mutilation of our physiology and our physics just to, to, to put things into our bodies that are harmful, foods that are harmful, um, toxic substances that are harmful. Without, we, d we don't try to preserve our lives. We just take chances and say things like you have to die from something, you know, or we dismiss yeah. 
the wisdom that some people try to bring to us. Laila Africa is preaching every day about nutricide. You know, he's talking about how we are eating ourselves into our graves. And when you go to a funeral, the minister will stand in the pulpit and say, the Lord called her home. No, the Lord didn't call her. Mm -hmm. You know, the pork and the other kinds of things, you know, <laughs> gave her, you know, accelerated her toward uh, an early end. So talk about self-hatred, because everybody else I'm reading is t t finally has to come to that. We have to have to get to the bottom of this hatred of ourselves that leads us to do things that are destructive of ourselves and of each other. Well, you know, what you have just described, um, Dr. Hilliard, Asa Hilliard, in the introduction to Stolen Legacy, uh, summed up by saying that uh, mental slavery is worse than physical slavery. You're talking about we're talking. You're talking about people who have been mentally enslaved. Uh, they believe that they are free and don't realize that the chains are on their minds. What we're what we have to acknowledge is that we have been the greatest victims of social engineering um, in in the world. Uh, the process of enslavement, stripping us of our humanity, stripping us of our language, our culture our concepts of beauty, our concepts of God, and then imposing upon us a false reality, and then releasing us from bondage, setting us free, knowing that we would never be able to uh, achieve a full state of humanity uh, in the absence of a sense of, 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 of the Love creator mm -hmm. that looks like us. See, if we had a, a God concept in which we saw God looking like us, I, I, I submit to you, then we wouldn't be, be, be changing our hair. We wouldn't be doing all these things that we're doing. But because of the fact that we don't see ourselves as God. We don't see us. That's see, blasphemy, you know. Well, among, Negroes, am, am, among Negroes it is. Mm -hmm. but, but we don't stop to think about the fact that uh, during the time of, of the man known as Jesus, uh, there were no Europeans. In, the, in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. so, so why is it that all of the pictures of Jesus are blonde hair and blue eyed? Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't question those things. We don't think. We don't uh, question everybody, it. Everybody's been lied to. Black and white mm -hmm. have been lied to. You know, but what, what, what I see is that everything is changing. Everything is in a state of flux now. And things are going to be changing more rapidly than we could have ever imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure you probably have taken note of the fact that time seems to be speeding up. The years are going by faster and faster and faster, and there seems to be this, this sense of, of, of reciprocity that is happening quicker than ever before. It used to be when you did something, you could wait three or four years before it caught up with you, but now it's almost you instantaneously. You reap what you sow immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. So everything is speeding up, mm -hmm. and it's speeding up because we're coming to a point in time in history where the forces that have controlled and dominated the world mm -hmm. for the last 2,000 years are coming to an end. So, and that's the 20, desperation that we see. All of these efforts to take over the world in, in even uh, more severe forms. And denial. I, and denial. Global warming doesn't exist. Global warming is, is, is not real. It's so present. But, but, but see, what it, what it means is that we're moving towards a stage where, where this thing is coming to an end. And it's not the 2012 end of the world thing that folk are, are, are afraid of, what we're talking about is the end of a cycle. Mm -hmm. Every ending is a new beginning. Life is a continuous unfoldment. And so we're changing from one way into another way. And that changing is going to mean that the people who have held power for so long are now going to lose their power. Their time is up. And they know their time is up, which is why in a, a final act of desperation, they're trying to get as much as they can before it's all gone. Mm -hmm. So what those who will thrive, and I'm talking about beyond survival, mm -hmm. those who will thrive are those who have a sense of historical consciousness and understand that this cycle we've gone through this cycle before we've gone through this cycle many times all of the signs are there read the signs you have a clear understanding of what is happening and the key then becomes how are you going to prepare yourself for what you know is coming this is why you're saying 
that, it, you know, in the scripture it says only a remnant will be left. And this is why you're saying not everybody's going to make it. Because you can't make it if you're on the wrong if side. If you're not prepared. Yeah. If you're not a prepared people will survive mm -hmm. and thrive. And unprepared people will, as they say, go the way of the dinosaur. That's the, look, and, the, and the, the reality is that's the way it's always been. This is mm -hmm. nothing new. Mm -hmm. Look at ancient civilizations. Civilizations have existed thousands of years. Thousands of civilizations mm -hmm. have, 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 have come and gone over thousands of years. So this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it, because we lack a historical perspective, uh, we live in the moment never realizing that the moment is fleeting. Mm -hmm. This moment is gone. Mm -hmm. But all this moment is, is the past repeating itself over and over again. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, as Dr. John Henry Clark used to say, all history is a current event. Right, right. And if you understand where you are in a cycle, mm -hmm. then you know how you got here, mm -hmm. and you have a pretty good understanding of what's coming next. Mm -hmm. So you prepare yourself for what you know is coming next. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science, but, but you know, so getting, you know, getting, back to, getting back to the issue of what you asked me originally is, is about knowing yourself. Other cultures know their self. Other cultures know their history, their language, their God concept. They have traditions and values that have sustained them and their ancestors for thousands of years. Uh, everybody except us. So we have been separated from that only within the last five to six hundred years. So if we, are, if we are willing to spend time reading and studying, we can go back to before the point in time when our world was turned upside down and began to access some of that information, Sankofa, bring it back into the present moment, then use that knowledge to determine how we move forward. That's what the 25th Dynasty did. They reached back 2,000 years and brought the best of their ancestors to the present moment and then used that to jumpstart comedic culture and civilization. So that's what we've been doing. We've done that so many times. We've done it better and longer than anybody else. We're experts at doing that. That's why, you know, so that's, that's who we are. So for me today to study the 25th dynasty gives me a black print for how to move forward and create a future. I love, I love your use of language. You're very conscious of everything that you're saying. You're very precise. Another uh, question though that um, someone asked, you've already answered it, but apparently this person needs you to elaborate because she's, she's looking at not self-hatred, but now she's looking at the hatred of us by whites. And she says, since memory is embedded in our DNA, first of all, you have to agree with the premise mm -hmm. that memory is embedded in our DNA, could Caucasians' hatred of blacks be based on our having driven them out of Africa? They um, mad at us because of that? Well, on a subconscious level, and you know, Dr. Welsing talks about that, on a subconscious level, uh, that is present, plus the fact that, um, that there is this deep-seated envy of blackness. Black is the standard of beauty, has always been the standard of beauty. Dark skin, full lips, full hips, and, and, and if they can't get it naturally, then they'll use collagen injections and they'll do all these other things tanning to get the parlors. attributes, tanning parlors. <laughs> you know, uh, I saw a billboard uh, on the street here in Chicago, uh, spray tanning, and they even had a color person, <laughs> a black person. <laughs> you know, and, and, and some of our folk are probably stupid enough to want to do that because their, their white friends are doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but, but I think if we, if we look far enough, if we look back far enough, um, everyone always imitates greatness. Everyone always wants to imitate greatness. Um, you look at the music that we have produced. It's played all over the world. Jazz, R&B, hip hop. We have influenced the world. You know, the sports that, that we have overcome, that we, that we have mastered once we were allowed to play the games. Uh, basketball, then, then, then baseball, then football, boxing, Ball, tennis. tennis. Okay. Now, and, and so what, what that suggests on a basic level is that folk know, given the nature of who we are, if we're given an equal opportunity to compete, we will excel. So the only way that they can stay in the game is by changing the rules. I never forget when Tiger Woods first won the, the Masters. 
uh, one of the white announcers on television said that you know, Tiger Wood won the Masters, his first Masters, uh, with the highest score in the history of the Masters. And he said, Tiger Woods will become the yardstick with which we will measure our inferiority. All right. That was, a, that was a Freudian slip. And the only way that people who feel that way and think that way can survive is if they continue to place roadblocks in our path to prevent us from manifesting our full uh, creative consciousness. And once you understand the history of the people who classify themselves as Europeans, it's the only way that they can maintain control and power. It's the only way they've been able to maintain control and power through fear, through manipulation. They are the biggest bullies the world has ever seen. Now, now there, there's this big trend now in bullying, bullying. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been bullying Come black on. folk. They've been bullying black folk ever since we've been here. They're, they're masters of bullying. But, but we have to begin to understand our enemy. One of the things that, that I wrote in one of my books, Survival Strategies, Survival Strategies for Africans in America, uh, 13 Steps to Freedom. Uh, the 13th step was, was to prepare yourself for war and peace. We don't realize that we're in war. We, we've been living in war for the last 500 years and don't know that we're in a war. No, we call it black on black violence. Well, well, well no, 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 no. I mean, let's, let's be clear now. We don't know that we're in a war um, because uh, the, first, the first battlefield in any war is the mind. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if your enemy can make you believe that he's your friend, when he's hell-bent on destroying you, that's a way of ensuring your, 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 your destruction. But this, this thing about black-on-black -black violence is a misnomer. Whenever we do something to each other, it's called black-on-black -black violence. But what was World War I? What was World War II? What was the Revolutionary War? What was the Civil War? White-on-white -white violence. Mm -hmm. Let's call it what it is, white-on-white mm -hmm. -white violence. Mm -hmm. White folk have killed more people. And Martin Luther King said this. White folk killed more people in the 20th century than have died in the history of mankind up to that point. So these are the people we look to for moral direction? These are the people we look to to teach us about God? See, now, if you don't know your history, then you allow the devil <laughs> to teach you <laughs> how to be human. But once you know, then you can step back. And, and see a different reality. And, th and that's what it's about doing, stepping back into your own space and freeing yourself long enough so that you can hear the voice of your grandma telling you, well, you know, you need to be doing this instead of that. But this generation is about the Benjamins. This generation is a generation that we produce. We failed this generation because we thought that integration uh, would be the answer to our prayers. And we no longer educated our own children. We turn our children over to our mm -hmm. to Other the children people. of our enemies to educate them. And this is what we get. You know, it was a time during segregation, we had schools in our own community, we had our own doctors, we had our own dentists, we had our own lawyers, and we did well. Relatively speaking, we did well. And once we gave all of that up, we've been catching hell Ever since it was Dr. Martin Luther King, 1964, when he was at the White House, when Lyndon Johnson signed the civil rights legislation, he turned to Ralph Abernathy and said, "You know, I think we've just integrated into a burning, burning house." house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he knew he saw the handwriting was on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, but but it was it was too late at that time, and then he died shortly thereafter. He tried to make amends uh, at the last year of his life when he spoke out against the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they killed him just like they killed Malcolm. And then they, they, they put him on the staff, they give him a holiday, and they reduce him to one event in three words, I have a dream. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because we have allowed his memory to be erased. So, so my contention is, my contention is, the problem with black folk is not white folk, it's us. We have not taken the time to know ourselves. We have not taken the time to, to study how we have continually been engaged in warfare, physical warfare, psychological warfare, educational warfare, economic warfare, spiritual warfare, 
uh, uh, intellectual warfare, as Jacob Carruthers would say, with people who have been responsible for putting us in what Malcolm referred to as hell. You know, you, you, you can be in a situation for so long you become comfortable with that. We were comfortable living in hell. What person in their right mind would say, I live in a ghetto? Nobody, nobody in their right mind wants to live in a oh, ghetto. ghetto fabulous. You know, nobody in their right mind. So, so the reality is we are out of our minds. We are out of our African minds, as I said in the Browder Fire. We're out of our African minds. But the reality is it took 500 years to create the insanity that we see in our community. Our behavior, the behavior that we exist is unnatural behavior. No other people on this planet exhibit that behavior. No other people on this planet have gone through what we, what we have gone through. So reality is we've only been free for less than 150 years. And we've made some strides, but we need more time to make more strides and to realize what's really going on and to determine our own agenda as opposed to letting someone else set our agenda. So uh, realistically speaking, I would say in about another 250 years, we'll finally get our, fit, we'll finally get our footing and we'll be able to move forward with, with, with some determination. 250 years is a job we'll in the We'll be bucket. able to swim forward with the global warming. <laughs> you know, in Forrest and the Glory, uh, Lerone Bennett makes the point that we were never truly emancipated, right. so does Kiari Cheatwood and mm -hmm. to save the blood of black babies. Mm -hmm. um, that the Emancipation Proclamation was never intended to free any slaves. Right. And so it's uh, probably a misconception for us to think that we are not still in bondage. True. Well, uh, Michelle Al Alexander says we're going through the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. You know, and incarceration is, is a 21st century form of slavery. So we are still incarcerated. We are still in bondage. We're still mentally enslaved. But we have longer leashes. Exactly. We can we can move further away. We can move closer to the fence and mm -hmm. further away from the back door. Mm -hmm. And you think about what Sister Harriet said. She freed hundreds of slaves, but could have freed thousands more if only they'd they known knew. that they were enslaved. Right. Now we have to talk about the Nile Valley contributions to civilization as a book, not as the the whole lecture that you gave okay. to ask. Well, Nile Valley Contribution to Civilization is an overview of who we were, what we did, and how that knowledge influenced Western culture and civilization. Okay. You don't want to say well, anything. I've been yeah, talking about that, it for the last few hours. I know, hours, I, but there, know. there may have been, <laughs> been some things that you might want to mention that you haven't yet. Mentioned. Well, well let, me, let me mention this. Let me mention the this. The excavation, the excavation that we're engaged in in Egypt right now is the first time in history that African Americans have been involved in an excavation to this extent, financing it and fully participating in it. And that we are uncovering the remnants of a tomb that was created 2,700 years ago that I think, no, that I know contains knowledge and information that we can use as our formula to create a new society today. Um, uh, what, the, what the 25th dynasty did 21st century Americans living in Africa could do right now if we followed their example. And, it, you know, it, it's not rocket science. We have to begin to sit down and take stock of where we are, understand how we got where we are, and make a commitment to do better. It's as simple, I mean, it's, it's not complicated. It's, if you're honest with yourself, if you're honest with yourself, and, and, and look at the good you did and the bad that you did, and then forgive yourself and say, I'm willing now to do better for the rest of my life, and make that your fullest commitment, your fullest commitment, then we will see meaningful and lasting change. So we've always had the power to free ourselves, just like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. You know, Dorothy always had the ability to go home. Mm -hmm. But uh, as Glenda the Good Witch said, if I told you, you wouldn't have believed me. Mm -hmm. So they got to send you on this journey to, to risk your life, do all this craziness. But you, we've always had the ability to free ourselves. Mm -hmm. We just have to be willing to do the work and look within and accept responsibility for ourselves. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, to be responsible for yourself. To not put it on God, to not put it on Jesus, to not put it on the white man, to not put it on your husband or your wife or your mama or your daddy or somebody... Take responsibility for yourself. Take responsibility for yourself. It's not that hard. 
And once you do it, once it becomes, once you rewrite that memory, that, that neural pathway within your consciousness, it becomes the way you live. It becomes a model for the young people in your environment to emulate. It gives them choices. It gives them options. That's how we free ourselves. It's not that, I, I, don't, I don't feel it's that difficult. Well, you don't feel most, th th some of the things you do proves that you don't feel that much of anything is difficult because here you are across, uh, across miles and miles and miles of water and sand digging. And uh, the last I heard, you were trying to recruit some support. You, you needed to have, uh, I think, 300 people make contributions on a regular basis, and you needed 30 people to do something else, mm -hmm. and you needed some other people to do something else. Uh, but whether that happened or not, uh, as far as I understand, you are still over there digging. Yeah, we're, we're still moving forward. Right, but, right. But, but, but the point is, the point is that what we're excavating in Egypt is going to benefit all mankind. It's going to benefit all mankind. And what I, I want to be able to do is to expose people with it to what we're doing so that they can make a choice to be a part of this transformative process. Well, talk about the professor that told you that there were people who had built their homes over, let's talk about right. that. Well, How, that's, that's the site that you're, you're right. excavating. Right, that's Dr. Alina Pistakova who first discovered this tomb that we're okay. working in in 2006, uh, that they literally built their homes over, over these tombs and raided these tombs like, right. as they have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. it's, that's their way of life. That's what they know to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she discovered this tomb, or rediscovered this tomb. It was originally first discovered by Europeans in 1824. She rediscovered it in 2006 and uh, committed herself to ex excavating this tomb. And other, her associates turned their back on her because uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with the 25th Dynasty, and I'm inclined to believe they didn't want to have anything to do with that because 25th Dynasty is African, and excavating this tomb will prove that everything else that, that preceded them was also created by Africans. Uh, so we've been working together since 2008 via the ASA Restoration Project to raise funds and to take people over to participate in this process. We're now documenting the work that we're doing. We're making this information available uh, through uh, school systems uh, throughout this country so that we can begin the process of training the next generation of historians and, 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 and archaeologists and Egyptologists and engineers. Uh, that's what we can do. That's what we are doing. And anyone can support this effort. They can go to our website, www.asarestorationproject.com, asarestorationproject.com. They can see the work that we're doing. They can make a contribution online. If they're interested in joining our mission and coming over, you don't have to be an Egyptologist. You don't have to be an archaeologist. You just have to have a desire to, to, to work. And we're asking people to come there to work. We don't need people who want to trip out. Well, I'm with the ancestors. No, we don't need that. <laughs> Save that for someplace else. We need people willing to work at least six hours a day for, for two weeks. We work in the hot sun, it's hot, it's dusty, it's dirty, and, and, but it's, it's, it is a transformative experience to be able to reach down in the dirt and pull up objects that, that haven't been seen in 2,000 years and to be able to know that you are resurrecting the spirit of your ancestors by uncovering these artifacts, that you are creating a gateway, a doorway through which they cannot speak to you and tell you, show you what they did so that you now can follow their example in order to replicate what they've done and restore your consciousness and restore your community. This is, this is the model that the first human beings on the planet have perfected. And as I see it, this is our, this is our way out. This is our way out. And this is how you. How long have you been doing this now? Uh, we're going on our fourth, uh, our fourth year through the ASA Restoration Project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how long do you anticipate you will be doing this? Well, we thought we had just about reached the end of the excavation last season before we found new rooms, okay. <laughs> new rooms that uh, appear to never have been disturbed by humans before, 
new rooms that are connected to the temple portion of his tomb, uh, new rooms that extend uh, underneath the earth for about 90 feet. So the, it, it's, it's quite possible this season, uh, the summer of 2012, we will make some profound new discoveries that will help us rewrite the history of Cush and ancient Kemet. I don't know if universities are still doing this, but when I was at uh, Northwestern, I wanted to take courses on anthropology, and you had to get the permission of the instructor. Mm -hmm. I could not get permission, and as far as I could tell, there weren't any other blacks who would get permission to take these courses. There are some areas of study, some that are difficult to access because the universities don't permit you to get involved or major mm -hmm. in those. I mean, so the fact that you're over there being an archaeologist, I, I don't presume that you took archaeology in school. Nope. So you just over there being an archaeologist mm -hmm. in the same way I presume that those early people in Kemet, when, when engineers were needed, from when architects were needed, obviously they had to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. There weren't any teachers to teach them. So at some point, somebody had to assert that they know how to do this right. and do it. And so here's an opportunity for, for people who want to learn something that they may not be able to access in any other way to learn it, to come and learn archaeology, to learn, to learn to treasure the remnants or the remains of things that have been hidden from view. Now, you talk about things that have been hidden in plain sight, right. but these things have not been visible. We have not known them. We have not seen them. So now, you, how are you able to know what it is you've seen when you unearth something you you have some idea because you have a context right but then some things you just have to wait until you get some other parts of the sentence to mm -hmm. finish it out mm -hmm. you get the verb to go with the noun exactly. then you know what the sentence is exactly. i mean we, we we found over the last over the last uh six years uh, we found over seventeen thousand fragments how, where, how do you keep them? You put them oh, in? We, we, we had, there's, there's another tomb that's been totally destroyed that we use as a storage facility. Okay. So we keep pieces as small as this or as large as an automobile. Okay. We, we have their number, their, their photograph, they're registered, and that's what the people who assist us are, are doing. But let me tell you this, uh, Dr. Peace. Uh, we have scheduled this summer uh, nine professors, no, nine students and three professors from Morehouse who are coming over. Uh, they have uh, created a six-week study abroad program where they're going to do our, our study tour to Egypt and then our mission, and the students will get eight credit hours for coming. Uh, we plan next year to be able to take over students from Howard University, and we're in conversation now with students from Lincoln University. So we are opening the door to make it possible for uh, several of our HBCUs to come and be a part of this project to train the next generation On of the researchers. job training. Exactly. Okay. And then will there be, are you writing at the same time? How are you, how are you, met? How, what are you doing? How are you balancing all these? Well, yeah, Wearing all these hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, one of the projects that we, we are uh, working on is um, developing curriculum from, for the material, from the material that we're, we're developing, that we're excavating. And we're doing this uh, to coincide with what we know is coming next year. Will Smith currently has in production a film mm -hmm. called The Last Pharaoh, in mm -hmm. which he's going to play Taharka. Oh, really? Yes. And, and so being forward thinking, what we plan to do is to develop uh, the curriculum of Taharka and put him in the context of the 25th dynasty, put him in the context of the tomb that we're excavating, and put all of that into the context of the history of Kemet to connect all of these dots and to produce curriculum that will be made accessible to uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college so that we can begin to affect the next generation of youngsters, African American, European American, Hispanic American, you name it. Everybody needs to know this history. Everybody needs to know this story. This is not black history. This is world history. We just need to present it in the correct context so that people begin to understand that this is the history of people who happen to be African. And this is what African people did, and we are their descendants. And we are uncovering this information and sharing it 
with the world. Do you think you're going to have to refight the battle of proving that because it hap happened in Africa that these were black people or not just some <clears throat> some people who were not Negroid, who were who were whites or gods from some other planet? You know, the, the battle has to keep, you well, have to keep justifying that these Africans are black people. Well, as Dick Gregory said, truth never has to be validated by ignorance. Ignorant people can say whatever they want to say. Mm -hmm. I'm very clear about mm -hmm. who these people were, and we present our information from that clear perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't expect everybody to agree with us. Fine. Folk are entitled to their right to be wrong. That's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We know what is right, and this is what we're going to put out there. And it's simply a matter of getting this information to as many minds as possible so that they begin to have options. They look at what we wrote. They look at what National Geographic writes. And hopefully they'll have enough intelligence in order to distinguish what is real from what is a falsehood. And you know I, that's why I'm appreciative of uh, the time that we spent now uh, to have this conversation so that you can share this information with the Chicago community and we can have more people begin to realize that if you want to be a part of an excavation, a truly groundbreaking experience, uh, pun intended, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, go to our website, acerestorationproject.com. Uh, get information on how you can contribute, how you can help finance this undertaking. If you want to come to Kemet with us, uh, uh, get details on the application process. Submit your application so that you can be a part of future mission. If you want to establish a, a cultural circle, uh, uh, create a space in your That's home. That's right. That was one of the things that you talked about. I'm reading about. your mind. I got you. I got Go you. Look ahead. <laughs> you know, if you want to establish a cultural, a cultural circle, uh, a, a study group, uh, where this, where you can learn to to teach this information uh, to your family, to your friends, to your sorority members, or your lodge members. Uh, we've got that information available. If you want to have a a cultural salon, have a gathering of people come to your home where you can secure a a, a DVD with me talking about this and share this information. Look, what's important is that at the turn of um, the 20th century. As the second generation of formerly enslaved Africans were preparing to move into the 20th century, a group of black folk got together and created a book which provided all of the information that any man or woman needed to know in order to uh, navigate life successfully. And they produced this book and they made it available to black communities through barber shops, through beauty shops, and black folk would gather in their home and read this book. And it had very simple instructions uh, when to get married, how to get married, how to select a mate, how to court somebody, when to have children, how often you should have children, how to build a house, how to plant a garden. You know, uh, very practical information on how to guarantee yourself a meaningful and productive life in the 20th century. I see us being given the same opportunity right now in the 21st century. We have an opportunity to, we have an opportunity right now to reach 150 years into the future and shape the minds of the next seven generations. That's power. You know, and that's what free people do. Free people don't just think about themselves, but they think about the lives that will come after. They think seven generations into the future. And as we do this work, we, we will train generations of historians, of archaeologists, of Egyptologists, of artists, of writers, of engineers, of architects. We will train them. And history will record what we did at this particular point in time. Now, we don't have to ask anybody's permission to do this. We just do it. And when it's done, our great, 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 descendants will remember us and they'll pour libation and call our name and evoke our spirit to come and continue to guide them as they continue their great and mighty walk. That's how we do it. I, wanna, I don't want to add anything <laughs> to that. I do want to find out if there's anybody who wants to ask any question, make any comment. Um, you know, give a pr give a word of praise. Um, I, I had a question.
question earlier, but I'm reluctant to ask it now because it's gotten so high in this deep thought. <laughs> um, however, I will ask it. Um, our young brothers are seemingly associating wearing hair locks with the image of a bad boy syndrome, um, associated with gang and things of that nature. How do we get them to see that they are taught, they're taking an image that has been historically associated with kings and pharaohs and greatness uh, to how to reversing the image, reversing it, and then presenting it to the world as a negative image? We, we talked a little bit about how we need to return those negative images that we have that degrade ourselves. But however, we have taken great images as well and reverse them, and sort of... Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> the media is the most powerful form of, of mental, manipu mental manipulation ever created. Um, anytime you can create reality, project reality into somebody's consciousness and they accept it as their own reality, that's a powerful tool. And we have allowed uh, our oppressor uh, to do that. For, for our children. Uh, and one of the things that I suggest that parents do is take control of your household. If you have a child living in your house who is under the age of 17, they should not be listening to any pornographic mu music. They should not be listening to any CD that has profanity. They should not be watching anything that will lead them down what we know is a self-destructive path. We have to exercise our authority as parents in our household. Short of doing that, your children will be turned into monsters because what they are consuming are negative, uh, life-destroying uh, images, words, and behavior. So, it, it, you know, it, it's not rocket science. You know, if you consume poison, you're going to die. If you engage in, in risky behavior and think that that's a pathway to success and popularity, you're going to die. It's simply a matter of time. So the only way you change that is by changing it. It's, it's not going to change itself by itself. And there's money to be made off of feeding our children poison. There's money to be made off of glorifying uh, destructive lifestyle because what it does is it plants in the mind of that young, impressionable child that this is how you make it in the world. This is how you make it into a prison or make it into a grave. That's what it's designed to do.